Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. Source of life and cause of death. Water can wash away clues, dilute evidence, and conceal corpses. For investigators, water can be a cunning opponent. For criminals, a most accommodating ally. For the perfect crime, just add water. chilling cases in Canadian history. The victim and the perpetrators are all teenagers, between 13 and 16 years old, and all but one are girls. A crime so violent, it sent shockwaves through Victoria, the peaceful capital of British Columbia, and made headlines around the world. Rena Verk, who has been living in a foster home, was going to spend the weekend with her parents. On Friday night, a friend calls to invite her to a party by the river. Rena first says she would rather stay home, but in the end decided to go. Rena's mother is concerned for the safety of her rebellious daughter. I don't know if I feel comfortable about this. Her mother said, don't go. These girls don't like you. Why would you go? Well, I think they want to bury the hatchet. I think they want to make it right. And she agreed to meet them. By early morning, Rena has not returned. Her mother calls the foster home, but Rena is not there either. By law, the foster home is obligated to notify police when residents miss their curfew. For a youth to go missing on a Friday night and be reported missing, especially from a foster home, which is where this girl was at the time, is not unusual at all. Normally, they return home uh, within 72 hours. By Monday morning, Rena is still missing. The police make inquiries at her school. In the following days, disturbing rumors begin circulating among the students. The number one rumor was that uh, there had been some sort of altercation and that a young girl had gone missing or, in fact, perhaps had even been murdered. And what made the case a little more difficult at the beginning was some of the kids had reported seeing the missing girl after she was allegedly murdered. So the information was inconsistent. This is a young lady who had been missing before, had been reported missing before, and as a result, we believed that she would probably show up in the next couple of days like she had in the past. Rena's parents emigrated from India. Desperate for attention, she was excluded by her peers and became estranged from her family. Some accounts, nice girl. Other accounts, she's uh, lied about things to do with her parents. She's lied about things to do with her friends. And she had a hard time fitting in, so she would do what she could to fit in. Rumors circulate that she was savagely beaten by a swarm of kids and that she had died from the attack. But there was nothing concrete. We didn't have anybody who had seen her be killed. We had nobody who had heard firsthand because we're trying to get a feel, are we doing a missing person case here? Are we doing a homicide investigation? Finally, the police get the lead they've been searching for. Someone identifies Chloe and Jesse and said they'd been bragging about beating Rena so badly that they broke her nose. It happens that these two girls actually live at the same foster home with Rena. The police pay them a visit and take them in for questioning. Things begin moving quickly after that. It wasn't very long before the first girl started confessing to the being involved in the assault. 
um, to what she knew about the actual murder. Uh, she didn't witness the murder, and she only had it second and third hand. Bob Downey gets the first confession. Chloe gives him the names of all the attackers. One boy and seven girls. The boy is 15 years old, and the youngest girl has only just turned 13. But one confession isn't enough. Bob Downey authorizes arrest warrants for all of the suspects. He takes charge of their interrogations. This is not a case where you had young people breaking down and crying and getting upset. And I can recall a number of the young females who were responsible for the assault sitting in there and chatting and laughing. And I recall walking through there almost feeling disgusted. It was almost uh, unexpected. The police learn that these kids often meet under the Craigflower Bridge in a riverside park. The bridge is near their school, and each week they party there until late into the night. A favorite hangout, hidden from the watchful eyes of adults, where the kids feel free to do anything they want. The victim was lured to this location uh, under the auspices of coming to a party, and, um, you know, they set her up. They lured her there, and uh, they were ready and had planned to beat her, um, and that's what they did. On this particular night, Rena had decided to join the group under the bridge. When Rena saw Chloe arrive, she knew she wasn't invited to the party to bury the hatchet. Chloe immediately starts in on her. One girl even had a cigarette and burned her right in the middle of the forehead, which my opinion would be that because of the victim's uh, ethnicity, that that would have been an insult to her and her customs and to her family and everyone. And I think that would have been done intentionally. And this girl responded with uh, a swing back and basically the fight was on. And then other kids started jumping in, to the point that eight kids jumped in. They swarmed her. She had no way out. She, there was no way she was going to win this or escape with the mob mentality that kicked in. At that point, she had nobody in the world. There was nobody there for her. There's nobody on her side. One of our suspects finally saw that she had had enough. And this girl was tough. Uh, she was a kickboxer, she had been in fights before, and they knew that she was a tough girl, and she made the other kids stop. She said, enough, she's had enough. Anybody else wants to hit her is gonna have to go through me. And it was good that she did that, because that assault would have carried on. They stole her bag from her, and they, it was almost like, uh, like rats with a piece of meat. When the swarming is over, the attackers leave Rena to her fate. So she was mobile at that time. She was walking slow. Some describe her as staggering. She didn't talk to anybody and started walking uh, across the bridge in an easterly direction or towards Saanich. Kids that saw her describe her face as being bruised already, uh, bloodied nose, um, and like I say, s staggering in her walk. All eight of the young attackers make a pact. They agree that Rena was last seen crossing the Craigflower Bridge. Then a twist. Six of the kids say that Warren and Kelly broke away from the group and followed Rena. But Kelly and Warren insist that they simply went home. The contradictory statements lead the police to expand their investigation from a missing persons case to a possible homicide. Police decide to focus their search in the river under the bridge. The gorge is a tidal river that flows from Victoria Harbor. It's overgrown with weeds and brush and has a strong current. The police are well aware that their search will be tough. Well, the water, 
It's your enemy. It's, it's an enemy for any kind of investigation, especially uh, with forensics. It's both a psychological barrier for policemen and for criminals. Quite often, a, a criminal will dispose of something in the water thinking it's gone. No one's going to find it. I'm safe. It's been thrown, you know, quote unquote, in the ocean. Well, that's what the dive team's there for is to remove that psychological barrier to go down there and to find the stuff. The dive team has determined the search area, taking into account the level of the tide on the night of the crime. The river isn't very deep, but the bottom is mud. Every step makes the water more murky. For the divers, this means visibility is almost nil. They will have to feel their way in the dark. Rick Gosling knows how hard it is to look for evidence underwater. You do it first quite often by touch. And from a flat, muddy surface to suddenly uh, reaching out and touching a body it can be uh, quite emotional, quite uh, scary. Um, and then out of the, the gloom, I suppose you'd say, uh, the body sort of blooms up on you. Um, and the fact that the visibility is so bad, you have to be quite close to actually uh, confirm that it is a body. Um, psychologically, it's very hard on a lot of divers. They make the first discovery, a pair of girls' underwear. Most of the items um, we find are on the bottom. They're not floating anymore. They're not subject to the tides. Quite often, objects that sink to the bottom, even light objects, um, like clothing or papers or things like that, once they become waterlogged um, and touch the bottom, quite often they stay there. As on dry land, every precaution has to be taken when recovering evidence underwater. You never know what small amounts of evidence may still be just slightly clinging to the fabric. So what we try to do is, uh, every time we seize an object underwater, we try to have a large enough bag that we can encompass it without perhaps picking it up and moving it. And in that uh, way, we also capture some of the water that's immediately surrounding the object that may or may not contain um, trace evidence, hairs, fibers, things like that. Next, the dive team finds a pair of jeans. So at that point, we thought that we were on the right track. We had been moving in the direction that we thought uh, a missing girl might be if she'd gone into the water at that time. We felt confident that uh, within a short period of time, we, we might find her. Hours pass and the divers have found nothing more than the two pieces of clothing. It was very frustrating, and we felt sure that she must be somewhere. It, it would have to be an extremely unusual, heavy, fast current to move a body once it's on the bottom. So we, we weren't sure why we weren't finding uh, the missing girl if we found her clothing, unless perhaps she just wasn't there. A week has passed, and Rena is still missing. Crown Prosecutor Stan Lowe is anxious to charge the suspects as soon as possible. But on what grounds? Will the teenagers be charged with Rena's assault or with her murder? A 14-year-old girl has been missing for a week and is now presumed dead. One boy and seven girls are in custody in Victoria, British Columbia. These kids have admitted to savagely beating Rena Verk. As yet, no charges have been laid against them. The investigators continue to search for the missing girl. A Coast Guard helicopter is brought in to help with the search. The water is very dark. It looks almost like a deep, deep gray color um, at that time of year. We uh, passed over the dive team, and we're only within about 400 meters of the dive team when we actually, we'd only just really started the search and uh, just absolutely surprised. I looked down, and uh, there she was in the water. She was very, very well hidden from both uh, the shore and from a uh, boat on the water. However, from the helicopter position right above, it, it was crystal clear that she was there. The investigators are surprised that Rena's body was not found downstream of the bridge where they had recovered her clothing. 
contrary to logic, the body had drifted upstream and became snagged in the tall weeds, hiding it from sight, except from the air. She was floating just below the surface, probably an inch or two. She was wearing a, a T-shirt, as I recall. Um, but of course, uh, nothing else. We found the, the clothing she had on, uh, both her, uh, her jeans and her underwear prior to that. Um, so it was really just a T-shirt she was wearing. The divers proceed with caution to avoid disturbing the muddy riverbed around the body, being careful not to destroy any trace evidence. Obviously, the body had been in the water for a week. How much, if any, physical evidence or DNA would there be? For the chief investigator, Bob Downey, the discovery of the body means they can now begin to build a murder case. So the finding the body, it's almost a, a relief. It's one less thing to do. And it sounds cold to say that, but we now have a crime scene uh, that we have to go in and deal with it in a forensic manner. And we have a body, so that puts other investigative steps into place. The news of the discovery sends shockwaves through Victoria. People are horrified and outraged that a group of teenagers could commit such a ruthless crime. The murder attracts worldwide attention. It had a big impact on the city, uh, in my opinion, because of the age of the people involved and the fact that you had a young girl who'd been murdered in the area in which she lived. And not just that, but that you had other young people, almost children, I mean, we're talking about people 13 and 14, 15 years of age, who were the suspects in this. So this wasn't a case of a, a pedophile or something like this, but this was, you know, children murdering other children. What makes this case particularly disturbing is that all the accused are teenagers. Seven out of the eight are girls. Rena's body has been taken for an autopsy. Finding the cause of death is crucial. If she died because of the beating, there would be eight murderers. If she drowned, there would be only two suspects, Warren and Kelly. Whatever the outcome, the autopsy bears witness to the extreme brutality of the attack. What I can tell you is that uh, the missing girl suffered significant trauma, uh, deep, deep tissue bruising. She had internal organs that were bruised. Um, it was significant trauma, and it was of a crushing nature. I've seen several autopsies. I haven't seen this level of bruising uh, take place before, short of it a perhaps in a car crash, that, that type of injury. The results prove Rena did not die from her beating. Deep in the tissue of her lungs, the pathologist finds traces of gravel. I attended the autopsy as the exhibit officer, and the cause of death was, uh, well, she was, she was drowned. And I believe that was indicative with the victim being forced down. It was fairly shallow water where she was drowned, and probably the last attempt to get a gasp of breath in near the bottom and sucking those small pebbles from the ocean floor into her throat. The investigators focus their efforts on Warren. According to the testimony of the gang, he is one of the two kids who followed Rena on the bridge after the attack. Warren's life has been difficult. At 16, he's been living on his own for over a year. His father has moved to California, and the last time Warren saw his mother, she was dead drunk in her trailer park. Warren became fascinated by a Los Angeles gang called the Crips. They inspired him to start his own, the Crip Mafia Cartel. He would always wear white and his gang blue. He took the investigators to the scene, basically walked them through what had happened, minimizing his own involvement. More as uh, I was there, I saw it happening. I believe he might have said he was peripherally involved in a bit of the assault. The police begin to put pressure on Warren. They tell him that Rena's body has been pulled from the river 
and was nude below the waist. They suspect she had been raped, and DNA analysis would prove if it was Warren. They also explain that they are looking for fingerprints on all the evidence, in particular from the running shoes they found on the riverbank. For the first time, Warren looks off balance. He admits that he and Kelly demanded that Rena take off her jacket and shoes, and that he had picked them up. Desperate for help, Warren asks to speak to his father. He was overheard yelling on the telephone to his father, uh, and he swore, he said, I really fucked up. You know, that's, it's about what he did. It's not about what happened to the, to the missing girl. And that's, again, typical with most of these kids. The interrogations are complicated by the Youth Criminal Justice Act. Warren is 16 and Kelly 15 at the time of the murder. Kelly simply refuses to cooperate. She declares that she had no idea what happened after Rena walked over the bridge. Even though witnesses had seen her and Warren following Rena, the police can go no further. With the Youth Criminal Justice Act and with the Young Offenders Act of the day, once they say, I don't want to give a statement, we have to stop. Kelly lives with her mother and stepfather, a middle-class family. In her group of peers, Kelly is the most laid back and withdrawn. Soon after her arrest, the police search Kelly's locker at school. They make some disturbing discoveries. One thing I distinctly remember is some drawings that were seized from the school locker of the female suspect. One of them, which depicted a police officer being shot and the bullets hitting the officer and then blood spurting out. Chloe also dreams of becoming a gangster like her hero, Al Capone. In fact, she's made a good start in that direction, which is why she has ended up in a foster home. Jessie's story is a similar one. Her mother couldn't control her violent behavior and placed her in the home with the hopes that it would calm her down. Armed with dozens of search warrants, the police look for evidence from all the suspects. They even seize the clothing they wore on the night of the attack. All these exhibits are sent to the forensic lab for analysis. The dive team returns to the crime scene, searching the riverbed for any evidence they may have overlooked. We started coming across little things, uh, a small address book, um, pens, uh, like a pencil, a funny little eraser, and then we started coming across papers. Individual leaves of paper about the size of a, a journal. You would have thought they had been, they, they would have been washed away, but they were still stuck on the bottom. And it was obvious very shortly after that that this was the missing girl's diary. Uh, that, yeah, that was pretty emotional. Rena's diary is sent to the RCMP forensic lab. Maybe it holds some clues that will lead to her murderer. Rena Verk has been swarmed, savagely beaten, and drowned by a youth gang. Police search for clear motives behind such a cruel attack on a 14-year-old girl. The police dive team has just recovered Rena's personal diary in the Gorge River. The diary is sent to the RCMP forensic lab. John Kovacs, a document specialist, gets down to work. Every second counts as the water continues to dissolve the paper, dilute the ink, and wash away trace evidence. First, the most important thing was to separate out the single pages so that any information that was visually present could be preserved and passed on to the investigator. All evidence found in water must be bagged with the surrounding water to preserve trace evidence. In the case of paper documents, it has to be done quickly before the paper decomposes. 
paper when created is probably 97% water and a few fibers kicking around. As it's actually created into paper, it removes the water and the fibers are left in place. Now that the document has a natural fact and subjected to an environment where the moisture is there, it swells considerably and starts to break down into its uh, component parts. The first task is to separate the pages that have begun to bind together. There were, in fact, areas that had been eroded. In this particular instance, almost all of it was readable text and was in actual fact predominantly written with a ballpoint pen, which is not a water-soluble ink. I did, in this particular instance, create a photocopy record of all the documents so that the investigator could, in actual fact, handle that with no concern as to possibly causing any kind of uh, problem with the original document itself. John Kovac's objective is to preserve the documents so they can establish potential links between events and people that might shed light on Rena's swarming. The police widen their search. They begin to question family and friends of the accused in order to piece together a motive for this violent attack. The investigators discover that in the two weeks leading up to the attack, Chloe and Jesse, Rena's roommates at the foster home, had been on the telephone a lot with Kelly. When they were in the planning process, they had talked about bizarre things like taking her into the woods and burying her in a hole. I mean, um, again, this is all, you know, what other kids have told us. Investigators learn why Chloe and Jesse were angry with Rena. She'd stolen Chloe's address book and then phoned Chloe's friends telling them horrible lies about her things like Chloe had AIDS. Chloe was absolutely furious. Worse still, Rena had been flirting with Sam, Jesse's boyfriend. The girls had seen her wearing his jacket. Some even said that Rena had slept with Sam. When Jesse heard that, she screamed that she would take revenge on Rena. Absolutely, it was payback. You can't do this to me. You can't sleep with my boyfriend. You can't take my books and call my friends and say that I'm, I'm good friends with you because you're a misfit. But nothing gave a strong motive to Warren and Kelly to commit such a brutal act. Throughout the interrogations, Warren gives several different versions of the events. He maintains for the longest time how he'd simply headed home without having seen Rena again but the police have an eyewitness. What we have is uh, an eyewitness who says, a missing girl going, and then two others going. And as we described it later on, we have three people going across the bridge, only two came back. Warren finally admits that what the witness said was true. He really intended to go home, but Kelly asked him to stay. She said, come on, let's go see if Rena's okay. Later, he told us, I knew we weren't going to see if she was okay. We were going to uh, do her more harm. Warren finally gives a full confession to the investigators. The girl asked the missing girl, are you going to rat us out? And she's beaten. She, she's beat up and she's got no means of protecting herself. And of course her answer was, no, I'm not going to rat you out. girl, the suspect, then said, we're not done. They took her jacket and they took her shoes. They folded those things up and they put them off to one side. So now they started with an upping, again, to humiliate her even further, to, to again, show that power that they had over her. And then the boy and the girl just started beating on the missing girl. They started um, both of them punching and kicking. It was a horrific scene to the point that she went unconscious. The two of them then dragged her down to the gorge waterway. On the way down, her 
her jeans started sliding down, uh, exposing her buttocks. Warren says that when they arrived near the water, he saw that Kelly wanted to drag Rena into the river. He asked her three times to stop. But Kelly didn't. She pulled Rena into the river, deep enough to hold her head underwater for a very long time. The boy described seeing red foam coming to the surface from, from where uh, the girl's being held under, and he would see this in the moonlight, that it was a full moon that night. Kelly continues to deny everything. She maintained she'd simply gone back home that night, like all the others. She remembers taking a shower before going to bed. She insists that the others had decided to make her the scapegoat, but she is innocent. In the end, the diary does not offer any new clues. I probably didn't know a lot about the victim, but formed some opinions from reading her diary. And I felt that this was a, a young girl growing up, wanting to be accepted, wanting to be popular, having probably difficulty in the home because of their expectations, uh, which were normal expectations because of the value system of her parents uh, and her, you know, battling against that. Despite some limited evidence, the lawyers have their work cut out for them. They must prepare strong cases against eight accused. Six for aggravated assault and two for second degree murder. Prosecutors decide that Warren and Kelly will be tried as adults. In Victoria, British Columbia, eight teenagers stand trial for the beating and murder of Rena Burke. Six young girls are charged with aggravated assault. Warren Glowatsky and Kelly Ellard are charged with murder. People around the world await the results. The assault case is airtight and should be over quickly. The prosecutors have evidence, eyewitnesses, and confessions. The girls are charged under the Youth Criminal Justice Act. They all plead guilty and are sentenced to between six months and a year in jail. Warren and Kelly are tried as adults. Both appeal the decisions, but the appeals are rejected. There are no witnesses to the murder. No one saw Kelly or Warren drag Rena towards the river and drown her. Crown attorney Stan Lowe is looking for concrete evidence that will put the suspects at the scene of the crime. Could water have washed away the incriminating evidence? The first piece of evidence is the pair of jeans that Warren was wearing the night in question. Will they put him at the scene of the crime? He was wearing white jeans. He had a girlfriend at the time. And as I mentioned, he was had one of the witnesses that was sleeping over at his house. Both the girlfriend and the witness described as about a dime size or quarter size, uh, what they thought was blood stain on his jeans. And he took his jeans and his socks and he washed them. He actually asked for instructions how to bleach the spot out of his pants. When we got the jeans later on, we were able to find the mark, but we were in, unable to uh, trace it back to actually being blood, and that's because of the bleach that was used. He didn't want to be tied to that at all. He knew there was evidence there, and he did everything he could to get rid of that evidence. The next pieces of evidence are the shoes worn by the accused. Each pair is placed in individual exhibit bags. Scott Green examines the shoes at the RCMP forensic lab. He notices something strange. What I found later was those shoes, albeit they appeared to be dry when they went in the bag, they started to sweat and water leached out of those shoes and formed in the bottom of those bags. That didn't happen with any of the other shoes that we seized. And my theory today is that those were the same shoes that those two suspects were wearing the night of the murder. They got soaking wet and they never completely dried out. 
the forensic analysis was deemed inconclusive. It was not strong enough to place them at the scene of the crime. The third piece of evidence is the pair of jeans recovered downstream of the victim. Forensic analysis found no DNA evidence to put Rena in the jeans. The fourth piece of evidence is the jacket found near the Craigflower Bridge. The jacket had its own interesting story. It was taken from the girl, it was folded up and, and put down. A person coming by on a uh, bicycle found the jacket, thought it might belong to a friend of theirs. They picked up the jacket, saw blood on the jacket, and they took it home and washed it. The Crown Attorney knows that without concrete evidence, it will be nearly impossible to place the suspects at the scene. Although Warren has made many confessions, Kelly has denied everything. Warren goes to trial first, charged with second-degree murder. From the beginning, Warren looks vulnerable. He looked young, small, nervous, apprehensive. Prosecutor Stan Lowe begins with a powerful opening statement. Three crossed the bridge. Only two came back. Warren admits to crossing the bridge with Kelly and catching up with Rena. It's one point for the Crown. I heard a very generalized, antiseptic version of events, which shifted blame from himself towards Kelly Ellard. And he portrayed himself as a person who was trying to stop her by asking her to stop no less than three times. But what he did was minimize his involvement. No detail. And it was completely devoid of any descriptors of the victim during the course of the incident. In cross-examination, Stan Lowe questions Warren about the events that night, moment by moment, but not in chronological order. He's counting on this tactic to throw Warren off balance. He did not discuss what his motivation was, so I took him there. He spoke in general terms of the events that occurred, but I took him through each one. I queried him as to what he was thinking at the time, what was going on, what did he expect to happen? Why would he assist in taking her shoes and jacket? He didn't know. On questions that, that probed into his actions, which I say speak louder than words, he didn't have a reasonable answer. The trial lasts a month. The judge delivers a lengthy judgment. Up until his final word, it's impossible to predict what the verdict will be. Guilty. The mandatory sentence at that time was a life sentence with no eligibility for parole for seven years. Warren was 15 years old at the time of the crime, 17 when he was sentenced to life in prison. The lawyers believed that Warren's conviction would help with Kelly's prosecution, or so everyone thought. In fact, the crime has provoked such outrage in Victoria that Kelly's lawyers have requested that her trial be moved to Vancouver, 150 kilometers away. After two years of delays, Kelly Ellard finally gets her day in court. She is admitted to being part of the first beating, but to nothing more. Kelly's lawyer emphasizes that nothing puts his client at the scene of the crime. No DNA, no fingerprints, nothing. He claims, quite simply, that Warren lied. Regardless, Kelly Ellard is found guilty and sentenced. Her lawyer immediately appeals. Five months later, Kelly is released. Catherine Murray, a colleague of Stan Lowe, has been following the trial. The cases that I was working on were the Crip Street Gang cases when we heard about the appeal. And I immediately phoned my office and said, I really want to do that Ellard case. Stan was involved in another murder trial, and I ended up taking it. This was a horrific crime. It just terrified the people of Victoria. For prosecutors, that, that's just the ultimate challenge. It really matters. While preparing herself for the trial, 
Catherine Murray learns that the jacket Kelly wore the night of the crime was seized during a search. It had what looked to be dried salt stains on the jacket, almost up to where the waist would be and up the arms a little bit. Robert Groves at the RCMP laboratory in Vancouver examines the stains on Kelly's jacket. He asks for a water sample from the river to be used for comparison. I wanted to try to replicate what would happen if this particular garment, not a garment similar to it, but this identical garment was in contact with seawater. What happens? So the collar was dipped, the water wicked up into the fabric. You could see it gradually soak up into it. When I felt that I had enough transferred, I removed the collar from the liquid and let the jacket dry. Once it dried, I was able to see a similar pattern of this random line of white material in the area where the collar had been dipped. And all I ended up finding basically was the sodium and the chlorine. So I was able to basically solve the puzzle to some degree that the jacket certainly could have been in contact with seawater. And because the elements that I found on my test area were indistinguishable from the elements I found from the questioned area. The evidence was not sufficient to put Kelly at the scene of the crime. However, Catherine Murray has an idea of how the jacket might still be put to good use. Murray develops another tactic. She asks Warren to testify at Kelly's second trial. Warren, by this time, was serving his sentence. And he was just working on himself. He was getting involved in all sorts of programs, taking counseling. Warren agrees to testify. Seven years after the crime, Kelly Ellard's second trial begins. This time, Kelly will have to face Warren for the first time since their arrest. Her demeanor was interesting. In direct examination by her lawyer, she was one way. And then in cross-examination, she kind of turned. And she kept telling me to hurry up. I was wasting her time. She'd cry. She'd deny over and over. At one point, she said, no matter what you say, the answer is no. It was kind of an interesting examination. Warren told a very compelling story. He told how he and Kelly then started attacking the victim, beating her, punching her, how she fell to the ground. They started kicking her, stomping on her, actually physically getting on her, stomping up and down on her until she stopped moving, clearly unconscious. How Kelly then took one of the victim's feet. He took the other, and how they started to drag her towards the water. How once they got to the water's edge, he stopped. And he watched as Kelly dragged the victim into the water, up to about her waist. And then how Kelly held the victim's head underwater until she stopped moving. He then told us how the victim was floating. At the end of Kelly's cross-examination, Catherine Murray pulls out the jacket and shows it to Kelly. The courtroom is shocked by Kelly's reaction. I just held it up and I said, the jacket tells the story, doesn't it? And she sort of broke down and said, you've got what you wanted. I'm going to be convicted. I'm going to be in jail for the rest of my life. Does that make you happy? Words to that effect. The jury's verdict, a bombshell. After five days of deliberation, Ellard number two resulted in a hung jury. 11 guilty and one not guilty. When that happened, 
uh, we immediately got on the phone and we started phoning the witnesses, told them, and they said they'd be there for us again. So we started up again and did LR3. Warren came through again and uh, she was, Kelly was found guilty. Murder, second degree murder. Kelly Ellard appeals yet again, but in 2009, her conviction is reinstated, putting an end to a legal case that spanned more than a decade. In 2007, after his apology to the Virk family, Warren Glowatsky is granted day parole. I don't think this girl died in vain. Her legacy has, has accomplished a lot. This made international news at the time. And what it did is it brought the issue of youth violence to the forefront, not just in this city or in this province, but right across the country. Uh, and it was significant. Warren and Kelly believed that water would hide their secrets. But that was not the case. Perina Virk, justice has been served. <laughs>